So we are in 1 Samuel chapter 9. Last week we left off in verse 14 where we are introduced to an important individual. And who is that individual in 1 Samuel chapter 9? Saul, Saul right? We are introduced to Saul who is a man of the tribe of Benjamin and his father is Kish. And we are introduced to Saul in part because we are sort of given an origin story about how the kingdom of Israel, the, the monarchy, is established. And when we're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 9, we note that Saul was an individual that was, at least physically, a pretty, uh, a pretty uh, what we might say as an ideal king physically. He had everything at his disposal, uh, his physical size, we talked about verse 2 that he was a choice young man, a goodly man. He had uh, sort of the characteristics or the personality of a king. And so having that good nature, being the type of stature that he was, he had all of the physical characteristics. However, we don't read about him immediately becoming king because we are sort of given the background to how, uh, really the background to what we're talking about tonight. And in 1 Samuel chapter 9, we come across Saul having to find his father's lost donkeys. And, of course, the servant of Kish and Saul, they go out to find the donkeys. And we talked about the travels that they made. This is a, uh, this is a trip that we talked about somewhere maybe in the vicinity of about 25 to 30 miles that they travel. In verses, uh, once they begin their journey in verse 4, and where they came to last week. Of course, again, thinking about this recap, you know, Saul at one point said to his servant that it was time to give up looking for the donkeys because my father is going to be worried about where we're at. And the servant, of course, maybe, be, maybe because he is uh, wary or he's a little bit afraid about what might happen to him if he was the one that was responsible for losing his uh, father's livestock, or his, or his uh, Kish's livestock, you know, he, he'd rather find that as quickly as he can. And so the servant talks about a man of God that lives in a city nearby, which again was uh, Ramah, and we know that that man of God is Samuel. And as the servant says, this man of God, whatever he says, you can trust, because as we talked about before, God has already indicated, the scripture has already indicated that everything that Samuel said, none of his words fell to the ground, or none of the things that he predicted or prophesied, none of those things uh, did not fail to come true. And so Saul, of course, agrees. It makes good sense. Then they have the problem of trying to figure out, you know, what do we take to give to the man? And they, they find a fourth part of a shekel of silver. And so everything is essentially set. They make their way towards the city, they come across some women that are outside drawing water. And because they knew of Samuel's reputation, but they didn't really know him personally, they have to ask the ladies where the seer or Samuel is located. And they tell him that he is uh, located into the city. In fact, they had come at the right time because Samuel had just arrived into the city. And so they need to hurry up and meet him. And in verse 14, we left off with how they come up into the city, more than likely talking about the very entrance to the city, and Samuel is coming out against them uh, to go up to the high place, which apparently laid uh, what was located outside the city. Uh, and we'll talk about that more in a moment. But when we come to verse 15, what's given to us is sort of the other side of the story, so to speak, because we talked about Saul's role in verses 1 through 14, but now we're going to talk about how Samuel factors into all of this, picking up in verse 15. So, looking at verses 15 through 17, the writer records for us, Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because their cry is come unto me. And when Samuel saw, saw, the Lord said unto him, Behold the man whom I spake to thee of, this same shall reign over my people. 
So as we talked about in verses 1 through 14, we talked about specifically how it appears that the providence of God is behind all of this. The timing behind Saul making the statement to the servant about wanting to turn back and the servant talking about this man of God, they happen to be pretty close to the city where Samuel's located. We talked about again how when they came towards the city, they came in and the the women that were drawing water had said that Samuel has just come into the city or that the, the timing was right, that they had arrived at the perfect time to meet Samuel. And we talked about how the providence of God seems to be at work in verses 1 through 14, but we know for sure that God was at work based on verse 15 because Samuel being a man of God, God communicated to him directly concerning this matter. Some, of course, might have suggested that up to this point this is all a coincidence, that Saul is just like any other individual, but the thing that was working for Saul was that everything was a coincidence for him. He arrived at the proper location not because God wanted it to be that way, just because he happened to be the man that, that arrived there. But the indication based on verse 15 through 17 is that God had identified Saul to be the king of Israel. Again, we see what's reinforced in verses 15 through 17 is that Samuel is not doing this alone. We know in 1 Samuel chapter 8, the people wanted to wanted Samuel to make them a king, but Samuel over and over again consults with the Lord uh, because he's a man of God and he, he trusts in what God says. And this further indicates this, that Samuel's not the one making the call. It's God who's making the call who will be king. And again, what we see in this passage tonight, the latter half of 1 Samuel chapter 9, is that God often presents opportunities of service to him at times when we least expect it. Because as we see with Saul, Saul's focus in verses 1 through 14 have been all about finding the donkeys, whereas that perspective is going to change dramatically based on what we read tonight. So again, God has been behind all of this. So verse 16, the Lord's very clear that Saul is coming out uh, and that Samuel will meet Saul. You know that it says that Samuel will anoint him. When you think about anointing, anointing is a very important term. In a general sense, it just means to set aside for a certain purpose. Generally, from what I read, when, you, when someone was anointed, typically it was often used with either animal fat and the oil off the fat or, or vegetable oil. Uh, and it would be poured on the head and sometimes rubbed into the head. And it was all, always uh, shown to, to be some type of special significance. Sometimes, in a general sense, it could be used to note a change in someone's legal status. So, for instance, if a woman was about to be married and she, you know, uh, becomes, uh, you know, she leaves her father's household, cleaves under her husband, uh, and they become one flesh, right? There's a change of legal status there uh, under the law of Moses. Sometimes uh, a woman, in that sense, would be anointed in the same way just to show uh, a change of legal status, at least in some of the cultures in the Near East at the time. But when it came to the people of Israel, generally anointing, again, was setting apart for a divine task. You see in the book of Exodus, altars and tents, uh, reference to the tabernacle being anointed, that it's that is, it was being set apart for a designed purpose of God. Of course, here Saul is, being, is going to be anointed because he is being chosen for a specific task. He is being set apart by God for a divine, uh, a divine task that he's going to carry out. That is, in verse 16, the divine task is that he will be captain over my people, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. So that is the divine task. One of the things that you note in chapter 10, after Saul has actually been anointed, uh, which happens in chapter 10, verse 1, you uh, read about in verse 6, it says there that the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. And the point being there is that you know, some might have objected to Saul being the king. Why did he have a right to be king? Samuel, why did you have a right to anoint him? But... What was indicated in chapter 10 and verse 6 was that this is going to be a way that God shows that he approves of what Samuel has done because God commanded him to do that. Just like in Acts chapter 2, we know that, that Peter and the other apostles 
were appointed by God to do this because we see you know, the Spirit of God descend upon them. They're able to speak in tongues, uh, just showing God's approval. Right, so that's what's being uh, stated here. God, again, is setting apart, he, he's anointing, but he's setting apart Saul for a divine task, a specific task that he wants to carry out, and that's to be the captain over his people. Now, we've talked about this word captain. It uh, also can mean prince in the sense of this is God's regent. He's not, Saul's not acting as a completely sovereign ruler. He's simply God's servant that's been put in place to be the captain over the people. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 30, sometimes this word was used to denote a person that uh, was expected to be king but had not yet become king. And in, and in 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 30, that term is used to describe David. At times, there are, the usage of that term was there was the expectation that you had to prove yourself when you were given the title of captain or prince. And generally, it was connected to the idea of military service. And what we're going to see going forward is that Saul essentially proves himself to be king because he's going to help the Israelites with dealing with the, I believe, the Ammonites in chapter 11. Yeah, the Ammonites in chapter 11. So it makes sense why Saul's being given this. And what it shows to us is that God continued to provide for his people despite their lack of faith. Because again, 1 Samuel chapter 8, God pointed out that the people had rejected him. They had shown a lack of faith in his system that he had put in place. They wanted a different system. And God very well have said that, you know, he's going to allow them to put their system, but he's not going to have anything to do with it. Uh, but what's given here in 1 Samuel chapter 9 is that God would continue to provide for his people despite a lack of faith. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 27. Isaiah carries along sort of the same thought. Let me turn to that passage real quick. Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 27. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? So the point being they're talking about the destruction of Assyria. The point is, is if that is... God has a plan in place. There's nothing that man can do to go against that. Right? God's ultimately in control. We've been talking about the book of Romans. Romans chapter 3, verse 3 deals with the passage about, you know, can the unfaithfulness of the unbelieving Jews stop the faithfulness of God? Well, Paul said, no, that, that wasn't going to happen. Even though the Jews tried to cru crucify Christ and, and to stop his will, that ultimately was not going to stop his will. Because God's faithfulness is greater and can continue to work despite our unfaithfulness. An important point to keep in mind. We know that based on verse 17 of 1 Samuel 9, again, that God's directives, His directions were specific. You know, verse 17, Samuel saw, saw the Lord said unto him, Behold the man whom I spake to thee of, this same shall reign over my people. Again, Samuel was not left in the position to try to figure out who Saul was by looking at all the people that came in the gate. God specifically told him who, uh, who Saul was. And we might could say that this shows Samuel's, to a certain extent, his trust in the word of the Lord. Right? Because Samuel doesn't have to worry about, you know, finding the right person. There's a trust and he relies on what God has told him. And it might be interesting, it might be helpful for us to point out here, you know, Maybe, maybe point out that there is a connection between, you know, your relationship with God, that there, there's a strong connection between having a strong relationship with God that comes with having a strong relationship with knowing what His Word said. You think about, again, that before Samuel, God speaking to His people didn't really happen that often. Uh, there was no open vision, as what's recorded earlier in the book of Samuel. You think about in this case, though, that Samuel is often communicated with God. We've seen it on a number of instances, right? Samuel could say that he had a strong personal relationship with God because of how much he knew what God's Word said. Now, we think about that in our time. Obviously, God does not speak to us in divine revelation, but I think it does go to show the point that we cannot have a strong relationship with God and not know what His Word said. 
There's some people that, again, that talk about that they have a strong personal relationship with Jesus. They've come to know Jesus. They uh, talk about how much they enjoy their relationship, but when you ask them about scriptures, uh, when you ask them passages about scripture, you know, defending uh, how they obtain that relationship, they're not able to provide it. When you ask them passages of scripture that are supposed to give evidence to what they believe, they can't provide it. And the point being is you can't have a strong relationship with God without knowing what his word said. Samuel evidently understood that. God spoke to Samuel. It shows a strong relationship that existed between Samuel and the Lord. Likewise, for us, we cannot have a strong relationship with God if we don't take into consideration what his word says and knowing what it says. Maybe that's a thought we could glean from here. So that's verses 15 through 17. Uh, in verses 18 through 21, we're sort of coming back to the present. Uh, we're, again, we're back in the present uh, of, the, of the time, uh, of the story going on here. Verses 18 through 21 says that Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house is. Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me unto the high place, for ye shall eat with me today. And tomorrow I will let thee go, and will tell thee all that is in thine heart. And as for thine donkeys that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them, for they are found, and on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee in all thy father's house? And Saul answered and said, Am not I a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Israel? Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? So what we have in, written for us, what we might picture in our mind is that Saul and his servant, they've come right to the gate. They've just entered the gate, and at the same time that they have just crossed over into the city, Samuel's heading on his way out. And so they're, they're meeting up at the perfect time. Generally, if you wanted to meet people of importance, it was best to do that at the gate of the city because the gates are where judicial matters were handled. Any important affairs within the city were often held at the gate of the city. So if you want to meet someone of importance like Saul is, meeting the uh, seer, uh, it'd be a good idea to be at the gate, which turns out that this is what happens. So again, Saul asked where the seer is at. Again, the, the, the timing is right. Fortunate circumstances here. Again, illustrating the provi providence of God at work. Now you note that Saul does not get his request right off the bat. Right, Saul? Saul does meet Samuel. He learns that Samuel, the man before him, is the seer. But what was Saul doing in the city to begin with? Yeah, Saul and the servant were in the city to begin with, trying to find what happened to Kish's, Saul's father's, donkeys. That was the whole reason they were there. And so you would think that if that was their purpose for being there, then the first thing that you want to do is to figure out what had happened to those donkeys. After all, if they had traveled 25 to 30 miles back in that day, that's a lot of travel. You would rather want to solve that problem quickly. I can speak for myself. Typically, I like to solve things uh, quickly. Uh, that's, you know, that's, a, you know that, that's something that in some ways may be good, but in some ways it may be uh, bad to a certain extent because sometimes problems require patience to solve them. Um, I have that, that, that thing, I have I, just personal story, I, I typically have that uh, issue sometimes. Uh, mom and I, uh, my, mom's a lot more patient than I am, uh, and there have been some times where I'm trying to work on something. She is a lot more patient than I am, Abby. I know you're smiling there. But uh, there have been several occasions where I'm working on something and I'm needing my mom's help, and I'm sitting there trying to, in my mind, saying, Mom, hurry up. Mom, hurry up. You can explain this a whole lot faster to me because uh, you're going too slow. Uh, but in reality, sometimes that patience actually helps me to avoid making some big mistakes if I'm working on something. I know that if I was in Saul's position, I would have wanted to, I would have told Samuel, I don't care what you have to say, just tell me how I can figure out where my father's donkeys have gone to. But that's not what happens. Verse 19, instead of immediately telling Saul what happens, Saul's supposed to go up to the high place and eat with Saul or to eat with Samuel today, and then tomorrow 
I will let thee go and will tell thee all that is in thine heart, or telling, them, telling him the location of where his father's donkeys have gone to. So the, the phrase there in verse 19, uh, to, to go up before me unto the high place, generally that was used to show a sign of respect. And so what you're seeing here is Saul being given a lot of respect that maybe he didn't uh, think about being given when he came into the city, but we know why, because he'll eventually uh, be told that he'll be king over Israel. Now, of course, when you think about this, again, you know, Saul's patience, it shows that he did have a certain level of trust in what Samuel was saying. Again, maybe if I was in his shoes, I would have wanted to uh, figure this problem out immediately. But, you know, Saul at this point is at the mercy of Samuel. He's got to do what he says. He's got to trust in what Samuel has said. And it could have been very easy for Saul to say, well, instead of doing that, I'm just going to get some men and figure out where they went to because maybe since Samuel knows where they're at, they're not all that far away, right? And, and Saul might have taken matters into his own hands rather than listening to what God, what the man of God had said, but he doesn't do that. He, his, his faith was prioritized, and, you know, that, that's a, a point we could bring up because we deal with issues in life. And sometimes we take it, we take the position that, you know, I can handle everything on my own. That's, uh, uh, and I can handle it the way that I want to. And that's how the problem's going to be solved when sometimes we have to put trust and faith in what God's system does and put faith in, in letting God handle the matter. Sometimes we have to do that. You know, we think about the things that we have to put faith in. I think Saul was in a position where he had to put faith in, in Samuel being honest with him. When we think about that for us as Christians, we have to put in, we have to take into account that we have to have faith that the blood of Jesus washes our sins away. Right? I cannot look in that baptistry and when someone is baptized, I can't look in that baptistry and when they come up, I can't see the sin in the water. Right? Because... That is uh, spiritual in nature. It's not water salvation, but you know what, what's represented in the, in the baptism process. Right? I cannot see sins washed away, but that's something that I have to put my faith that that's what happens in baptism. There are some things that I do not know about what will happen in the future. I don't know what will happen 10 days from now. I have an idea, but I don't know exactly what will happen 10 days from now. I don't know exactly what will happen 10 years from now. But I have to put faith that if God cares for his people, I've got, to put faith, I've got to put trust in that, that in terms of, you know, my personal salvation, if I'm doing everything that God expects of me, then no matter what happens, I have faith that it'll be okay no matter what happens in the future. That's a level of faith that we have to have, putting trust in God's system. So I'll put in trust with the man of God here, which he rightfully does. We have to do the same thing. If you would turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, because Paul, I think, illustrates this point too. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul begins talking about some of the adversity that he has faced. And really, some of the, uh, the because of the affliction, some of the difficulties with that. You know, and he talks about in, in verses 17 through 18, sort of the end result of all the things that he faced. He says in verse 17, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And Paul could have looked at the physical persecution that he faced and put his trust in that and said that, well, God doesn't care for me, otherwise I wouldn't be physically hurting in life. But because, God, but because Paul put faith in the system that God had, had put in place, he was looking forward to those things which are not seen. Even though he couldn't see the glory of heaven, he knew that that's what awaited him. And so Paul put his trust in the system that God had. He laid, later go on to say in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. And in the context of death, we don't necessarily have all the answers to what happens to man after death, but... There's a certain level of trust we need to put in our minds that if we do what God says, we'll be taken care of no matter 
our inability to know everything that happens after death. And so maybe that's a point we can bring out here. Saul put a lot of trust in the system that was given. Now we see that Samuel does pique Saul's interest because he does remind him, verse 20, that those donkeys, that they are found. He doesn't tell them exactly where they're found, but he says that they are found. And so maybe in this process, Saul's anxiety about it has been eased. Uh, and certainly the servant's anxiety maybe is at ease through this. And of course, Saul would more likely be willing to follow through with, uh, with Samuel's request, right, having known this. But here, here we go in verse 19 is the chain, or verse 20 is the change in focus. Whereas Saul's thinking about the lost donkeys, Samuel says they're found, but note the latter half of verse 20, and on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and all thy father's house? All the desire of Israel. The desire was not specifically on Saul. Again, the specific desire was on having a king to be like the other nations. But it turns out that Saul was going to be the one that would fulfill or fill the role of being the king. Again, we see the principle that God provides leadership for his people. Saul's going to be the hope of Israel to get rid of the Ammonites and eventually the hope to get rid of the Philistines. And so, as Saul is focused on physical matters, here's the opportunity for service to God in terms of being the king. And so Saul again is faced with the difficulty of determining the, you know, the mental battle of being concerned with the physical things, of finding uh, with the, the mental battle of, of facing a decision between prioritizing the physical things over the spiritual things, right? Do I just keep my focus on finding my father's donkeys and just simply shove off what Samuel has said that God is going to want me to do? That's the, that's the battle that's going on in his mind. Uh, that, or that's the battle that could be presented there. We know that there are a lot of people today that essentially, in light of maybe the example of this story, that there are a lot of people that are searching for their father's lost donkeys rather than observing the spiritual call of service. Right? Some people, in that sense, they're prioritized with doing and fulfilling all the physical goals that they have in life and rejecting the opportunities of service that God presents to them. We, of course, don't want to be like that. Uh, and so Saul's, Saul is being told here there, there's going to be a change in perspective. Instead of focusing on this temporal matter, there's a, there's a more important issue at stake. And uh, Saul is going to respond in verse 21 with a question, essentially, why should I be king, Samuel? What makes me in a position to be king? Verse 21, again, he talks about that he's a Benjaminite, or a Benjamite, right? The smallest of the tribes of Israel. And that his family within the tribe of Benjamin is the least of all the families of Benjamin. Now, we talked about in chapter 9, verse 1, that Kish was called a mighty man of power. And maybe what's going on here is that Saul is sort of doing the same thing that Moses and Gideon did in Exodus chapter 3 and Judges chapter 6, where when God called both individuals to carry out a certain task, whether it was in the book of Exodus, Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, or in Judges 6, where Gideon is called to deliver God's people from the hand of the, the oppressors, they both approach it the same way. God, what makes me special enough? What, what is it about me that makes it what is it about me that, that qualifies me to be in this position of leadership? And, you know, there's nothing wrong with self-deprecation. You can, you can point out that they had a, you know, Saul had a, at least it, it seems like a sense of humility here maybe. Uh, but there is an important point to note out about the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, even though it's a small tribe, Benjamin, if you looked on your map, and if I had PowerPoint tonight, this is where I'd pull up a map of the 12 tribes of Israel. Benjamin is centrally located within the nation of Israel. And the point being is that in terms of thinking about where the king's going to put a capital, it's better to have it centrally located than, you know, all the way in the south versus all the way in the north. And so maybe the idea of unity being there. Nevertheless, the point being is that God chose Saul, not because of who Saul was inherently, but because of what Saul could do by the power of God. 
So what qualified Saul here was not because, uh, again, because he, he had everything necessary. It wasn't because he had the physical stature and the good nature and personality. It's because that's who God said wanted that, that should be king over Israel. That was Saul's. That was why Saul should be a king. I know I've been talking a lot, but are there any comments on what you have um, looking at verses 15 through 21? Uh, this evening. Just remind us that talk about to know God, you've got to know His Word, and that just goes back to what Paul said. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. It's just, no, you cannot, cannot separate the two. And Saul was on the right track a lot of his life until he right. went the wrong direction, took his eyes off God, took, put his eye on himself. So, but a great beginning, you know, a great yeah. beginning. Absolutely, you know we bring up the we bring up the fact that it doesn't matter where you begin, you know, essentially in the Christian walk of life, it's where you end, as evidenced by the case of Paul. Well, the opposite of that is true with the case of Saul because he begins with a you know he begins on the right foot, uh, generally, generally speaking, he begins off on the right foot. But just because he has a good beginning doesn't always mean. Uh, did not necessarily mean that he would have a good end. And that is something to keep in mind with our walks, with our walk as Christians. We all, we all should be looking to improve on ourselves and grow in Christ. All right, verses 22 through 27, we've got about seven minutes left, so we'll kind of summarize this. Verse 22, Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought him into the parlor and made him sit in the chiefest place among them that were bidden, which were about thirty persons. And Samuel said unto the cook, Bring the portion which I gave thee, of which I said unto thee, Set it by thee. And the cook took out the shoulder and that which was upon it, and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, Behold that which is left, set it before thee, and eat, for unto this time hath it been kept. For thee, since I said, I have invited the people. So Saul did eat with Samuel that day. And when they were come down from the high place into the city, Saul communed with, Samuel communed with Saul upon the top of the house. And they arose early, and it came to pass about the spring of the day that Samuel called Saul to the top of the house, saying, Up, that I may send thee away. And Saul arose, and they went out, both of them, he and Samuel abroad. And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us, and he passed on. But stand now still a while, that I may show thee the word of God. Now the last couple of verses tie in pretty well with chapter 10, so we could talk about them more uh, next week. But verses 22 through 24, again, Saul and his servant are going to up to the high place. Again, not talking about idolatry, but they're going up to this feast, and Saul and the servant are going to be the men of honor. Generally speaking, whenever you had a feast like this, you could tell the importance of the person by the location in which they sat. Verse 22 indicates that Saul is going to sit in the chiefest place, which... Coming into this, Saul would not have expected, but again, this is going to demonstrate his importance to the 30, uh, as the King James uh, gives us, 30 people that are there as well. Generally speaking, the most important person sat at the end of the table and was designated as the most honorable guest. And then after that, the person on the immediate right of the person at the end of the table would have been the second most important person. After that, the next most important person would go to the left. After that, right, keep going down the table with the right always coming before the left. And then at the very end of the table, either on the left side or the, the center, would be the least important person. So there's importance there. And so uh, Samuel and his servant, they are being put in a chief location, which again, showing these 30 people that there is a special significance about Saul. Now you also get this in, in the type of meal that Saul eats, the type of animal, or the, the, the portion of the animal. Right, verse 23, Samuel already has it prepared, or has already told the cook or the butcher uh, what part of the animal that Saul will eat. And Samuel was a man that was very prepared. So, in verse 24, the cook took upon the shoulder and that which was upon it and set it before Saul. So, what's going on here is, what, what's pictured here in the language is that, you know, you think about a roasted animal, for instance. You think about like a, a pig that's 
completely roasted. It's, its head still intact. You know, we, we typically think about it having an apple there in its mouth. Uh, and you think about how when it's set down, the animal is cut up and the portions are divided. And what's happening here is that Saul is getting the first and the best portion. We talked about in, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, the king gets the choice things. Well, he's getting the choice part of the animal here, which is the shoulder. Uh, and I believe to a certain extent, and I believe in some of these, that typically the, uh, some of the priests would often get the, uh, the, uh, the best parts of the animal, or God would get the best parts of the animal. But what, what's presented here again is that Saul is getting uh, the, the best parts of the animal. Now, in verse 24, it says, "...took up upon the shoulder and that which was upon it." This may refer to the fat that was on the shoulder. Uh, and so, again, the fat has a lot of flavor. And so Saul is really getting the best of the meal. And so Saul eats that. And, and again, it's all about showing importance, putting importance on Saul. Whereas these other 30 people don't necessarily know that Saul, that God has called Saul to be king. The 30 people do know that because Samuel has brought him in and has set him in the chiefest place, that there's something special about Saul, which the people will come to understand in chapter 10 when Saul is anointed as the king of Israel. So after the meal, we see verse 25 that Samuel and, and Saul talk again. They're going to talk in private in verse 27. Uh, and this is going to, more than likely what's going on here is sort of Samuel talking to Saul more about what, what is expected of him. Because right? we, we've, we've got a basic statement back in verse 20, which Saul understood that to be, you know, he's going to be the king of Israel, but there's probably some other things that Saul needs to be instructed of that, that Samuel's going to talk to him in private about. Uh, and so that's where we will end tonight. We will pick up, we'll pick up in, in chapter 10, verse 1. We may explain some things in 26 and 27. Uh, with that being said, thank you for your time and thank you for your attention this evening.